We Could Live Forever by Isaac Cooper Chapter 1 My name's Yasmira Kaplan, and I'm looking for the thing we've always been looking for, ever since we crawled out of Earth's primordial muck. I'm looking for food. You don't have to worry about food in the hub, but we're not in the hub now, are we? We're in Istanbul, the streets lifeless, barren. Scouring these streets, I come across a pile of bricks, but there's no food there. Why would there be food near a pile of bricks? Seriously? You do understand, Yasmira, that bricks are not edible. They are inanimate objects made of clay, and you've just wasted a precious second of the day considering them. Get it together, woman. Walking through the twilight, trying to get it together, I pass storefront shops. There's an empty one. Another empty one. Can't get into that one, so I have no idea if it's empty or not. My guess? Empty. Empty, locked, empty, locked, locked, empty and locked, empty and locked, empty, empty, empty. It goes on and on, and does it get tedious? But the tedium won't defeat me today. I will not be going back empty-handed. Write that down in big capital letters, like in the old newspaper headlines. Here's Mira Kaplan, not going back empty-handed. More on page 34. Now, I'm at the end of the street, and the shops have been replaced by abandoned suburbia. Picket fences, fly screen doors, the works. The damp smell of decay rushes through me as I assess the houses. All rotting, splintered, most empty, locked. But hold on, what's this? A little two-storied beauty with an unshuttered window? Just begging to be broken, you say? Starting on the second floor, I pull open everything with a handle, turning the house clean over for the one thing that'll calm my rumbling stomach. The one thing that'll make me a hero. Okay, nothing. Well, I'll try things that don't have handles. Sliding pantry shelves. Bedroom mirror doors. A push closet hidden behind the staircase. Potato chips! I scream, snatching the packets and falling into the closet. I had a feeling this was going to be a good day. In fact, I knew it would be. I knew it. Thank you, God, I whisper to the darkness. Thank you, God. With four salt and vinegar chips in my pack, I slip through the broken window and skip down these brightening streets. I can hear the wind cheering me on, pushing me along. A spectacular achievement, the wind says. Well done, champ. I just can't believe it. Potato chips. What could be better? I suppose water could be better, but fuck that. I'm not diminishing what I found. It's something. You can't tell me it isn't something. When I get back, I'm going to be revered. I'll be praised and worshipped to my dying day. Maybe my brother Adam will somehow create a magnificent sculpture of me, chips held high in one hand, the other pointing to a not-too-distant future, a future where hot food grows on trees, where fresh water runs from the faucets, where, in my absurd thoughts, I almost skip into a corpse, sitting slumped against a terminal. Sorry, I say, skipping around him. Didn't see you there. I skip my way back to the hairdressers, an awkward, gangly building that must have been designed by a half-drunk, two-bit architect. It's no sight for sore eyes, but it was unlocked, and has roof access to start fires, which is all you could ever ask for. Entering through the front door, I proudly lift my chin. Hey, you find anything? Adam asks, sitting in an old leather hairdressing chair, looking at me through the cracked mirror in front of him. My lips curl into an I-have-food grin, and Adam turns around, eyebrows optimistically raised. I throw my pack between us. Adam searches it, gasps. Pretty good, huh? I say, resting a hand on my hip. Adam sinks into his chair, staring at the pack. This is... this is really good. Not just pretty good, really, really good. Ezra and Yusuf are gonna flip. Mmm, hopefully ride over. Adam turns up to me, frowning. Pardon? You know, I say, scooping the pack onto my shoulders. You said they're gonna flip, and I said, hopefully ride over. Adam's eyes narrow into expressionless dots. That's asinine. Now what does asinine mean? It means stupid. Dumb, Adam says. Boo-hoo. That was a dumb remark. Have you heard any of my dumb remarks, Adam? That wasn't a dumb one. I actually stopped to think before saying it, and I thought it worked. It didn't work. I pursed my lips. Well, I got the chips. Can't crucify me there, can you? It is a formidable achievement, Adam agrees, turning to the broken mirror, his face splitting crookedly down the middle. You should tell Ezra and Yusuf. They're prepping a fire. Right, I say, striding to the staircase. Yeah, as Adam says, as I take my first step. Yeah? We didn't find anything today. These chips. It'll cheer them up, I think. I wave my hands rapidly over the staircase. Jazz hands. What else am I here for, if not to cheer people up? Adam stops me again as I take my third step. Seriously, Yasmira, this is a good find. It's not very nutritious, but I don't care. Just... 
Nice work. Nice work. I take a bow, and my brother returns to the mirror, staring at the reflection which hungrily stares back. On the roof, Yusuf and Ezra Ivez converse in tones of restrained exasperation, suggesting a brother and sister on the brink of argument. Standing next to our makeshift fire pit, they scowl at me as the roof door slams shut. Find anything? Yusuf asks, crossing his big arms. Yep, I say, throwing my pack onto one of the sleeping bags surrounding the fire pit. Ezra, eyes tight and critical below her recently cut fringe, hurls a suspicious look at me. Are you serious? You actually found something. What? Potato chips, I say, unzipping my pack. Salt and vinegar flavoured. Ezra palms her eyes, sighing. This isn't the time for jokes, Yasmira. You obviously don't have anything. Are you sure about that, I say, reaching into my pack? If you had something, you'd have brought it out by now, Ezra says, dropping her hands. Look, you're a good kid, Ezra pats my shoulder, as if she's twenty years older than me. But we need to be serious for a minute. We haven't found anything in days. Yusuf and I were... Ezra stops talking when I reveal a shimmering, almost shining, pink packet of chips. Their mouths hang open, their scowls disappear, and there is a reverent silence. I can't ignore the savage, burning pride in my chest as Ezra takes the packet and falls to her knees, awestruck. It's just the one packet, yeah? Ezra asks, to which I bring out the three others. In the encroaching darkness of the roof, there is a wild cheering for me, Yasmira Kaplan, and my salt and vinegar chips. Hollering at the top of his lungs, Yusuf wraps his arms around me and explodes into a chorus of made-up song. Oh, Yasmira is here now with chips, with chips. My dear Yasmira is here now with chips. Yusuf spins me around, kicking his heels with a beat. I cannot deny how very divine this is. This is, oh, Yasmira is here now with chips. Are you quite done? I ask, even though a large part of me wants this to continue. And here we all were, the three of us looking all day, all day. Not a single thing found, not one little crumb of food, of food. Then Yasmira comes here with chips in her pack. Oh, her pack. Apparently out of lyrics. Yusuf stops and holds me. I think I love you, Yasmira. I think I fucking love you. I don't think you do, I say, pushing out of his arms. What you love is food. I'm sure your sister can attest to that. But Ezra is too busy staring at the chips. Uh, Ezra, I say, nudging her with my boot. Ezra brushes the boot away, but then it's back. The boot's back, nudging her in the leg. Shadows falling over us, Yusuf begins nudging his sister as well, and then she's up, locking me in a hug of her own. Getting hugs all around today, isn't that something? It won't last long, Ezra whispers. We have to talk about our next step, okay? Sure, I whisper, hearing the crack fizzle of a match being struck. As the darkness takes over, Yusuf rolls what remains of last night's hairdressing chair into the fire pit, and there is light, hesitant golden light. The initial licks of flame flicker softly, carefully, breathing in the cool night air and expanding. Soon the chair is engulfed in blazing tongues of fire, and the roof is almost entirely lit up. We instinctively gather around the fire, warming our hands, waiting for Adam. You're amazing, you know that, Yaz? Yusuf says, as a smell similar to roast turkey permeates the air. Obviously the hairdressing chair. I know, I know, Yusuf grins. So much for modesty, eh? To hell with modesty, I shout, melodramatically flinging a hand to the black sky. Yusuf holds his belly and chuckles. Ezra looks at her brother, then me. Big concern. We're running out of places to look around here. You both understand that, yes? We stare at her. These chips are all well and good, but we need to move soon. Very soon. Maybe even tomorrow. I let out a sigh. Can we discuss this after we eat? Can we just enjoy what I've found for one minute? A spectacular idea, Yusuf says melodramatically flinging his hands to the black sky. Ezra draws her sleeping bag closer to the fire. Okay, after we eat. Adam, I yell, get up here already. Haven't you stared at your reflection long enough? Adam shyly appears, creeping to his sleeping bag. Rightio, I say, handing out the chips. One for you, and you, and you, and me. And then the food is in our hands, and the fire is crackling, and it all seems too good to be true. Suppose the chips taste like absolute garbage. The packets are semi-deflated and wrinkled, 
meaning they're probably stale. But we've had worse, right? Stale chips can still taste good, right? It appears Yusuf sends to my doubt, because he rips open his packet and withdraws a single chip, nibbling it like a potato chip connoisseur. Mmm, Yusuf says, closing his eyes and slowly licking his lips. Lovely. Turns out they're not that lovely. But despite this, and despite Adam's recommendation that we save some for tomorrow, we start going crazy, shoveling stale chips into our mouths by the handful, grunting like animals. There's no possible chance of saving anything. There's madness in my companion's eyes. A madness only attainable by starvation. I imagine stuffing chips into my mouth, it's in my eyes too. Ezra buries herself in chips, feverishly munching away. Adam pours a lay packet down his continuously swallowing throat. Yusuf dispatches his feed with methodical, deadly proficiency, and then falls onto his sleeping bag, tipping his shit upside down for the remaining crumbs, which float safely onto his tongue. And then, shockingly, it's over. All my hard work finding these chips, it's all gone. We're left with four empty packets and four full stomachs. Worth it? Sitting back, licking my salty lips? I think it was. My stomach stopped growling, and that's always worth it. Adam passes around our remaining supply of water, a quarter full mug of rainwater, and then that's gone as well. Ezra wipes her mouth, leans on her elbows. We have to move, guys. We're out of food straight up, and we have to move. Ezra's right, Adam says, nodding. We've exhausted the entire area of food, and I mean, who knows if it'll rain again. That rainwater is what's kept us alive these past few days, let's be honest. I stare at the sky. Listening to the fire crackle and spit, thousands of stars in full view now, no light pollution holding them in check. How different the sky used to look before the hub, back when electricity was still a thing. I prefer it this way. Clear, vivid starlight. Well, I say, where would we go? The city, Ezra suggests. Yusuf, sliding into his sleeping bag, freezes. You want to go to the city? That's where most of the corpses are. Fuck that! It stinks in the city and everything's locked anyway. You only say that, brother, because the corpses scare you, Ezra says, giving me a knowing look. There's so much of the city we still haven't explored. It's our best bet. Yeah, it stinks, but that's irrelevant. We need food. They do not scare me. Why would they scare me, Yusuf says, trying to pass his uneasy frown off as a manly one. Ezra turns to my brother. What do you think, Adam? Adam slides into his sleeping bag, inching closer to the fire. I think we should go home. Home, we all exclaim, like it's an alien concept. Adam nods. Yeah, back to the Kaplan house. I'd say the Ives house, but you guys always lived in such a pain-in-the-ass place. Why would we go home, I say, watching Adam carefully. What'd be the point? There's nothing to be gained from going there. Yeah, I guess not, Adam says, elbowing onto his side. I know there's no food at home, but if we were going that way, wouldn't it be nice to see it again? It's just been so long, you know. Why would he want to go back there? What, so we can take a picture? Remember all the happy memories? That's fucking stupid. So, so fucking stupid. I mean, is he fucking serious or is this some gag? But Adam doesn't do gags, so what the fuck? What the fuck, Adam? What? You want to go home, I say, grabbing my empty packet of chips and throwing it into the fire. Why? Why in Easter Bunny's name would you want to do that? Um, Adam says, staring at me. I don't know. Ha! I exclaim, turning to the others. Did you guys get that? He said he doesn't know. Adam, my very dear brother, doesn't know why he wants to be a very dear cunt by suggesting something as retarded as going home. Adam's mouth pinches into a wounded, <laughs> wounded frown. I just wanted to see it again. Well, it's not happening. Don't you think it'd do us good to see it again? No, I don't, Adam. No, I don't. Ezra shakes her head, as if this couldn't be any less important. Look, we need food, and it makes the most sense to go to the city. There's not going to be any food at home. We all know that. I'm not even counting that as an option. So what's your call, Yaz? I'm saying city, Adam's idea is out, and Yusuf? I'll go anywhere but the city. Man, fuck the city. I slide into my sleeping bag, and Ezra slides into hers. Well, it's pretty obvious, I say. We'll go to the city. No! Yusuf screams, making us all jump. Ezra clutches her chest. Calm down, Yusuf, for fuck's sake. It's decided. We're going to the city. No, we're not. Yasmira, help me out here, would you? I'm sorry, Yusuf, I say, looking at him, bundled in his sleeping bag, shivering. I don't want to go home. It doesn't have to be home. It can be anywhere. Anywhere but the city. Yusuf, Ezra says, 
glaring at her brother. Enough. We're going to the city tomorrow, and that's final. Yusuf looks up at the sky, his eyes watering. Then maybe I'll just upload. I mean, what is this anyway? All this running around, searching for food, searching, moving, searching. Maybe I'll just upload and never have to worry about going hungry again. For a minute, no one else says a word. Yeah, and you know what else you wouldn't have to worry about, Ezra says, and I lift my head because she's lifted hers. You wouldn't have to worry about breathing, or bleeding, or shitting, because you wouldn't be human. You'd be a little piece of data. Having heard many of these speeches, I know the best thing to do is let her finish. They aren't human in there, but we are. We're human, and if everyone else on this piece of shit planet wants to be a piece of data, that's fine, but not us. Because we're human, and it's not perfect, but it's good enough. It's fucking good enough, Yusuf. That's why we don't just upload. Yusuf sighs, and Adam lifts his head, watching Ezra intently. Ezra's face is red, and she's breathing in great big huffs, her fringe blowing up and up with each breath. He didn't mean it, Ezra, I say. But who knows? Maybe he did. Ezra keeps huffing and huffing, the fire playing shadows across her face. We promised we'd never upload. We promised we'd never do that to ourselves. No matter how bad it got, we'd never sacrifice our humanity. Is that what you want, Yusuf? To sacrifice your humanity? No. Then you understand why we can't talk about it. Can't even think about it. Because letting any of those thoughts in... Just tell me you guys understand. Ezra waits for us to say we do. And when we do, she nods. Lies down. The only sound in the world, the fire's quick crackling which is fading. I throw our last bits of scrap onto the fire, a piece of crumpled paper, a bundle of hair extensions, but it's not enough. The fire swallows them up and begins to die, its bright tongues flickering down, tripping into smoke.